Thank you, Mr Chairman. And can I congratulate my honourable friend, the member for Isle of Wight, for securing a very, very important debate and making an excellent speech. And I've got no wish to repeat um, the, the brilliant research that he cited in that, in that speech. But he did highlight the repeated failures of mod modelling throughout this pandemic, uh, not just the modelling itself, but how it's been used. Uh, and these models have not just been out by a few percent. As he said, they've often been out by the whole orders of magnitude. Uh, and the way that those models have been used has had life-changing impacts on, on people across uh, the whole country. Before I was a politician, I used to be a science teacher, and one of the joys of teaching science to teenagers is, of course, conducting practical experiments in the lab. And once you've uh, ensured that they're not going to burn your lab down, uh, it's really important to teach them how to conduct an experiment properly and, of course, to write it up. And the first thing you start with is to create a hypothesis. So you get them to write a statement of what they think will happen and why, using the scientific knowledge uh, they already have, using some assumptions, and then, of course, to carry out the experiment, write up the, the research and very crucially to evaluate. So to look at the hypothesis, to look at what they've observed and decide if they match. If they do match, to, to go back and look at their assumptions and see why they're correct. But of course, if they don't match, if what has happened in the lab, if what they've recorded does not match the hypothesis, they need to ask why. What assumptions have I made that didn't bear out in real life, that didn't happen in the lab? And it seems to me that those are the questions that have not been asked throughout this crisis. You know, perhaps the first time, the first lockdown, you know, we can understand why assumptions had to be made quickly, assumptions that didn't turn out to be true. Although, as my honourable friend said, perhaps we're repeating history of 20 years ago, perhaps there is not that excuse. But subsequently, in subsequent waves and through subsequent restrictions, why weren't those assumptions questioned? Assumptions about how likely the different scenarios are, assumptions about people's behaviour, about fatality rates. Even back in December, when Plan B was, was voted through, some of the assumptions could even have been declared wrong in real time. That the assumption that Omicron was, no, was uh, just as severe as Delta, uh, the assumption that the, the, um, that the disease would escape the vaccine, um, all, some of the figures that were almost plucked out of the air and given no likelihood. These are assumptions that shouldn't, should have been challenged earlier, and we need to ask why. One of the assumptions that I, um, I picked up on following an interview with Dr. Peter Stryker, a South African doctor, he suggested that SAGE models have always assumed that um, infection rates don't reach a peak until around 70% of the population have, have had the disease, whereas the real world data suggests that infection rates start to slow uh, when around 30% of the population. And actually that makes a lot more sense from a social science point of view because we know that people are not equally sociable. And if you look at some of the studies of sociologists like Malcolm Gladwell, who wrote best-selling The Tipping Point, um, he describes this law of the few, where a very, very few people are extremely sociable and therefore pass on, whether that's a virus or an idea or whatever it is, to many, many people, but then there are much more people who don't, uh, who, who don't socialise as much, who, don't, who are not as good at uh, as transmitting. And it seems to me that perhaps we should have been looking a lot more at social science, at behaviour and people's interactions, than just pure virology and what might have happened in a lab. Because, of course, we don't exist in a lab. Uh, we can't model the interactions of, of human beings uh, that, e that easily. But, of course, the tragedy is this wasn't a paper exercise. This is an experiment that happened in a lab where you can go back and repeat until you uh, re achieve the results that you think you that are valid. Now, these models, and the, particularly the weight they have given, have been given, have caused serious destruction of lives and livelihood. And who was modelling the outcomes on education and, and child abuse and poverty? And who was modelling the impact of, of loneliness and despair and fear? And I think we have to ask, why weren't these assumptions interrogated? And my honourable friend, the member for High Wycombe, makes some excellent points about the need for institutional reform, and I completely agree with him. But I think we also need to look at the impact of free speech. And I think if we look at the beginning of this crisis in the media, the way that mainstream media took on this idea that lockdown was the only strategy, um, that anything that challenged the idea that we should do everything we can... Of course. Sir Edward, I'm very grateful. I just listened to her earlier. I think she talked about the repeatability of scientific experiments with hypotheses. I mean, one of the reasons I talked about C++ is if you use multi-threading, you can end up with code that doesn't produce repeatable uh, outputs. Would she agree to with me that it's very important that when models are run, they do produce co consistent and coherent outputs, which you can repeat? 
I thank my honourable friend and I absolutely agree with him. And I would have said to my students, it's not a valid experiment if you can't follow the same method, repeat the experiment and produce the same results. It's completely invalid if you can't do that. I'm not a software engineer. I take his word for the use of programming languages, but he's absolutely correct. If the, the whole experiment is not valid if you can't repeat the results. Um, so I think, yes, we need to challenge, make institutional changes, but we also need to look at the impact of freedom of speech, because I think if we look just over the last few months, there's been this opening up of debate that's moved from the spectator into mainstream media, where people like honourable friends in this room have been able to speak more freely about the problems and the costs of lockdown, um, and not suffered uh, so much... Uh, I hesitate to say abuse, but so much criticism um, in, in the media and on social media. So I think to avoid this happening again, yes, we need institutional change, but we also need an understanding that these are not black and white issues. It's good and right and wise to question the data, to question the science, and to put just as much weight on people's quality of life, the things that make life living, as the number of people in hospital at one time for a particular disease.